So tonight we're going to continue with the names of God. And the name we're going to study tonight is Jehovah Nisi. And it means God is my banner. And we're going to talk about what that means. And the documentation for that is going to be in Exodus 17, the whole chapter. And the first part of the chapter, I'm going to go ahead and read that because something very important happens there. So what's happened is that the children of Israel have left Egypt. You got to remember, they were not men of war. They were slaves. They were real good at making bricks. This is what they knew how to do. After they left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, which was another miracle. And then they came to Marah. Remember where the water was bitter? And then God told Moses to put that tree in, and then it became sweet. Well, you got to understand that the cloud is leading them by day and the pillar of fire by night. So God had led them to Rephidim. And they are on a march. They're on a march to Mount Sinai. And after that, they're headed for the promised land. Which is where? Israel. Oh. Yeah. So I'm going to start with um, chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. The commandment of the Lord means the Lord was directing them, that cloud would direct them where to go and the pillar of fire by night. So God was in charge. And they camped in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now they just had that problem at Mara. Remember the water was bitter. Now they got that problem again. You might think that they would trust God, but they don't. Hmm. Really? They didn't trust God? No, and there was no water to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. That means there was contention and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why are you contending with me? And why are ye testing the Lord? Meaning, you shouldn't be complaining because the Lord is with you. They've already learned he's going to take care of them. But listen what they say next. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. Now, they're saying really bad things. Hmm. And they said unto him, Why have you brought us out from Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So now they're acting like Moses has brought them out there for the purpose of killing them. Hmm. After all the miracles that God has already done. You know what they should have said? This is what they should have said. Moses, we need water. Could you consult with God and see if he can provide it? That's what they should have said. But listen what Moses says. And Moses cried unto the Lord saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Think how angry they were. It was like a mob mentality. And by the way, this is the first time stoning is ever mentioned in the Bible. This is even before the law. This is before Mount Sinai. But this was something they already knew about. I guess it was an easy way to destroy somebody if you don't have weapons. And something about a crowd mentality. If you were a single person and you were in a situation where you were suffering, you probably suffer in silence and try to get through it. But when you've got a crowd, then they start talking, oh, it's that person's fault, it's that person's fault. It's a mob mentality, and people always want to blame somebody else. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with you the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river Take it in thy hand and go. So the reason why he wants them to take the elders of Israel is because he wants a witness. He wants witnesses, one from each tribe, to see the miracle that God's doing. This is two and a quarter of a million people. They can't all stand around and see this. So that's why he said, take the elders of Israel. 
And he said, the rod which with you smote is the river. The river that he's talking about is the river Nile. When he smote that river Nile in Egypt, that was the first plague, and that was the water turning to blood. Ooh. So that's why he's saying, the rod wherewith you smote is the river. Take that rod in your hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Okay, Horeb is a mountain range. Sinai is a single mountain in that range, okay? But God said he's going to make an appearance to Moses so he'll know which rock it is. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So... This is a type right here. When it says that he would smite the rock, what do you think the rock represents? Christ. Christ. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the bedrock that the church is built on. So, but the Lord tells him to, to smite it once. Christ was only smitten once, right? So what we'll find out later on is that not tonight, but later on in the story of Moses, is that he has a problem when he disobeys God and he strikes a rock again when he's not supposed to. And God has to punish him by not letting him go into the promised land because he ruined that type. Christ would only be struck once. Verse 7, And he called the name of the place Massa and Miriab because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now those two names, Masa means tempted and Mirabah means contention. But think about it. They're wondering, is the Lord with us or not after all he's done? I mean, they crossed the Red Sea. He made the water sweet in Mara when they were bitter. They've got a cloud telling them where to go. They don't know that God's with them. Well, they constantly lose faith. So now we're gonna to get to the part where we're gonna to come to the name of God that we're studying this week, which is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. So now they're going to enter a war, and this is the first war that they're entering on their march to Sinai. And I want to tell you one thing about Amalek. This is a name of a person, and the Amalekites are a name of a people, but Amalek is a descendant of Esau. The children of Israel are the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. Jacob and Esau were twins. And something about these people, these descendants of Esau, they had no fear of God. And they were always being cruel to any stragglers that would fall away from the Israelites. They would be cruel to them. They were a mean bunch. Verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men. And go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So number one, he chose Joshua. That's not an accident. Joshua was a very reliable person. And Joshua would end up being the person who would succeed Moses. He would end up bringing them into the promised land. So... He's already being singled out here as somebody very important. And the name Joshua, that's a Hebrew name, in Greek is Jesus. It's the same name. You've heard Yeshua, Joshua. That's Jesus' name in Hebrew. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him. And fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, Aaron was Moses' brother. I don't know if you remember that. 
They're both from the tribe of Levi. So I don't know exactly who her is, but he was obviously somebody very trustworthy to go up to the top of the mountain with Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So who do you think is in charge here? I know I'm wrong with Moses. Moses, but through, no, no, Moses, but through the power of God. I mean, just holding up your hands doesn't make people win, right? And you can see when they go down, and he's got a rod in one hand. When they go down, they lose. I mean, this doesn't make sense. It's God. God is fighting that battle up on that hill. And just think how tired you would get just holding your hands up. This is going on all day and standing. Well, he got tired. And that's where Aaron and her come in. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You know, this is a really great lesson right here about people needing each other. God may call you to do something, but you might need an Aaron and her to help you, to help you serve God. Moses couldn't do this without those other men of God stepping up and helping him. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Now, this is the first time that God has ever told Moses to write anything in a book. And we find out later in the scripture that he continued to write. He was documenting the wanderings in the wilderness of the children of Israel. So this is the first documentation we have of that. And then he says, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from heaven. That means they're going to ultimately be destroyed. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Amalek. First of all, I'm going to read you a prophecy about Amalek. And this is a prophecy by Balaam, who kind of went the wrong way, but still God forced him to prophesy what he wanted him to say. And this is Numbers 20... 420 and he looked on Amalek and he took up his parable and said Amalek was the first among the nations but his latter shall be that he shall perish forever so you got to think about it why is God doing this I'll tell you why because they had the nerve to attack God's people. That's like putting your hand on his throne and saying, I'm going to take you down. And guess who's going to win that fight? Absolutely. But I'm going to tell you something about how the Amalekites finally were destroyed. Okay, this was their first battle with Moses. And then in 1 Samuel 15, 7, they had a battle with Saul. But some of them escaped. And then in 1 Samuel 30, 17, some of them were smitten by David. And then in 1 Chronicles 4, 43, the ones who escaped from David were completely destroyed by the descendants of Simeon in the days of King Hezekiah. What it says about these Amalekites, they feared not God. That means having reverence for God. They didn't care anything about him. Look what happened to him. It's a good lesson, isn't it? So there's no there's no Christianity yet? Because we're only talking about... No, that's, that comes in the New Testament. Uh -huh. These people believed in Yahweh. Yeah. God himself was leading them. I see. So, okay, in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith uh -huh. in God. In the New Testament, we're saved by faith 
in Christ. It's always faith. It never changed. The formula never changed. And it's the same God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is there's only one formula to get saved. It said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Wow, he was righteous? No. It was because he believed God. He ended up getting the righteousness of Christ, which Christ would die for eventually. So everyone before Christ's death was looking forward to the cross. And then everyone after Christ's death, like us, we're looking back. Everything was about him coming to earth and dying. That's what the whole thing is about. So now I'm going to get to the part where, where Moses gives his title to God, this name. So verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is my banner. So I want to talk just a little bit about what that means. Building altars to, to commemorate something important is very common in this time period and for these men of God. And it's an altar of worship. And it's always made out of stones of the earth. And he wanted to show that God completely and fully got the glory for the victory. He was giving God the glory. But when you think about a banner, a banner is like something you rally around. You rally around the banner. And when you think of even our flag in the United States, it's a banner. Think about the cavalry. You know, they'd be riding on horses and it would be somebody's job to hold the flag because that was their banner. Hey, we're rallying around this. This is something bigger than us that we're fighting for. When we landed on the moon, what did we do? Planted our banner, right? Planted our banner. And even, you know, I watched the um the weather channel a lot and i see these tornadoes and there's all this destruction and you know what you see people putting up flags mm -hmm. is a pile of nothing and these people are saying we are americans we are going to come back mm -hmm. well that's what moses is doing right here he's saying we couldn't do this this is something bigger than us and he is our banner and he will fight for us and you know, he will fight for you and me. I'll tell you something. In 1 Corinthians, I think I read this a week or so ago, but I'm going to read it again. It says, all these things that happened to these people, these children of Israel in the Old Testament, happened to them, for example, for us. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Meaning we're living in the end times. They were way before Christ. But remember when God told Moses to write it down? He actually ended up writing the first five books of the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit. But that was written so we could learn. So God could be our banner. We'll rally around him and he'll fight for us. And I'm going to close with one other group of verses, and that's 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says, I want to tell you where our fight is. It says, though we live in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now here's the hard part, and this is another war term. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's our war. We're fighting a war that isn't tangible, but it really is real. Sometimes it comes to us through people. And what I want you to get out of this is that God is our banner and he will fight for us of the war between light and darkness. And we will prevail because 
will win, just like Moses putting his hands up, will win because God is in control. Yes. 